Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it was a pleasure to listen to um, remarks about uh, she, uh, security program. It's also uh, personally to me very appealing, particularly that uh, at the Pulaski Foundation, we are honored to host the Polish branch of Women in International Security uh, Organization. But, uh, but um, I'm, I'm uh, more than happy to host and moderate uh, today's ministerial conversation uh, under the subject uh, from east to west to south, reflecting on the security architecture of Europe. The uh, purpose of this uh, panel is to reflect on the, sec on, on the current security architecture uh, of Europe, the role of nature and EU in responding to majority, major military and security threats. And we couldn't uh, um, dream better, um, better uh, speakers as uh, ministers of defense uh, representing uh, three dimensions geographically of Europe. We have today with us our uh, good friend, uh, and regular participant of the Warsaw Security Forum, uh, Minister of Defense of uh, Estonia, uh, Yuri Luik. Uh, great to have you back, although vi virtually, but, uh, but uh, we don't give up against pandemia. Uh, pleasure to have you. Um, we have with us uh, Minister of Defense of Romania, um, Nicolae Ciuca, uh, the country that is uh, working very closely with, uh, with Poland on uh, defense uh, subjects and we have uh, from uh, from the south but uh, but we are in the in the right uh, right corner at the border country of uh, of nato you are the the south uh, south uh, western corner of nato so we are very happy to have with us minister of defense of uh, portugal uh, mm, mr uh, chao uh, gomes uh, cravinho uh, pleasure to have you, sir, with us. Um, before, uh, before, we, uh, we will uh, before I will proceed with the first questions uh, directed to you, uh, let me remind our viewers, uh, both uh, that are watching our, um, our discussion over the, over the uh, platform, those who are registered, that we will have an uh, opinion poll that is uh, ongoing during the, the whole um, discussion. And there is a question in the opinion poll, is American presence in Europe a condition for European security? So we'll be happy to have uh, uh, views of our, uh, of our public. And uh, just to remind you that we are constantly uh, observed by around 1,000 viewers on uh, several different uh, media platforms like Twitter, like YouTube, like Facebook as well as our original platform of the Warsaw Security Forum. So um, the, last, uh, the last remark, uh, technical, is that uh, viewers can also ask questions live, um, also on the platform, in a chat, so I will be able to deliver them to, uh, to our honorable uh, speakers. So, uh, without uh, further delay, uh, let, me, let me ask the first question. It will be a question to the Minister uh, Yuri Luik. And uh, I, would like to, I would like to start with, uh, um, with American perspective. Um, Mr. Mr. Luik, what should be our response to President uh, Trump's uh, July 2020 uh, announcement of a potential withdrawal of US troops from Europe? Uh, regardless of who will sit in the White House, and I think it's, uh, at least to me, it's obvious that it will be uh, President uh, Biden. Can Europe afford to go along? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, extremely glad to be here, well, at, at the Warsaw uh, Security Forum, at least virtually, and uh, very happy also to greet my my two distinguished colleagues. Uh, hello, and uh, nice to see you. Uh, I'm sad we don't uh, see each other in, in person at the moment. Uh, when it comes to European security, then for me there's no doubt that uh, it should be very deeply connected to the transatlantic security. 
Uh, there are many reasons for that. We share the same values, uh, and also we share the same uh, approach to world security, if you will. But uh, also importantly, and this is a practical notion, uh, to build a credible deterrence against big players like Russia, we simply need the United States. I mean, even mathematically, uh, the, the, the numbers do not add up if the U.S. Uh, armed forces uh, uh, are not with Europe. Uh, when it comes to your particular question, then obviously, uh, and I have expressed it uh, in my own statement, uh, uh, we are saddened by the fact that there are ideas of withdrawing some of the troops uh, from Europe because we believe that uh, these troops, uh, as I said, play a very important deterrent role. Uh, on the other hand, I'm happy that some of those troops, uh, at least according to the plan, uh, there is an intention to, to move them elsewhere inside Europe, uh, to Eastern Europe, to Poland, uh, there have been also discussions regarding the Baltic states uh, and, of course, uh, to Romania. Uh, so I think that is a positive uh, approach. Now, what will happen when the Biden administration steps into office is difficult to predict, of course, because the uh, withdrawal of troops from Europe is planned by Pentagon as a very long term um, process. And it's evident there are various reasons starting from, uh, from logistics, building new bases, moving families. I mean, it's a, it's a long process. So we don't know uh, how it will proceed. Uh, and uh, obviously, the new administration uh, will, will make its decisions. But, but let me say this. I believe that the transatlantic relationship, it obviously has a strong economic dimension, it has a values dimension, but traditionally it has always had a military, a defense dimension, because that is one of the areas which unites us and which gives us uh, sort of united power. Uh, but it also builds a political bond between Europe and the United States, because defense is one of the most existential political issues which nation states might have. Uh, so I would very much emphasize that we shouldn't imagine that we can build a strong uh, transatlantic relationship or maintain it uh, without the uh, defense dimension. That's why I'm also quite uh, hesitant uh, when people speak about Europe going on its own. I don't see obvious reasons for doing that politically. Uh, and uh, as I already said, uh, the numbers also don't add up. And even European missions around the world uh, uh, actually use a lot of American uh, technology. Uh, they use drones, they use communication systems, intelligence. So we cannot afford to be without our U.S. colleagues. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for, uh, for your response. Uh, since we are limited uh, by time, uh, I um, apologize, I will interrupt. But uh, uh, let, me, uh, let me proceed with, uh, uh, with uh, another question that I would like to address uh, our friend uh, from, uh, from Portugal. I know that uh, minister is... Uh, um, very, very, uh, very experienced and has a broad knowledge about international uh, relations and affairs. So my question will be about, uh, about China. Is China a systemic uh, challenge for Europe? And how should we react to the worsening relationship between the United States and China, which most likely will become a permanent future uh, of the security architecture uh, we are facing these days? So what, 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 what's your perspective on China? Okay, well, thank you very much uh, for inviting me in the first place. It's great to be at the Warsaw Security Forum, although I would rather be in Warsaw, but 
maybe on another occasion. It's also great to uh, share the stage here with my friends uh, uh, Yuri and uh, Nikolai. I should point out that I've only made two uh, bilateral visits since uh, the COVID uh, came down upon us, and that was to Estonia and to Romania. So I'm very uh, pleased to, to now be sharing this uh, platform with the both of you. Uh, on, on China, China is, is of course a very, very major challenge. Uh, and we are at the moment at a stage where, where history is changing. We are at the moment where tectonic plates are shifting and the rise of, of China is something that is very, very evident to everybody. This uh, is going to be partially adversarial and uh, partially, I hope, cooperative. And I think that we need to be able to, to navigate and calibrate these two dimensions very carefully and closely uh, as Europeans and as allies of the United States, which is, of course, uh, the major superpower, but uh, rapidly uh, facing a, a, a rising China. I think that one thing that we need to be clear about is that China is not the new Soviet Union. The nature of the challenge that uh, China poses to us is quite distinct from the nature of the, uh, of the Cold War that we lived through for decades. And just to give one uh, obvious example, at that time, global governance was defined by the Cold War itself, by the adversarial nature of the US-Russian relationship. Nowadays, global governance has to take on board um, many aspects. Climate change is the most obvious, but there are others. Uh, migration flows and so on, which each country on its own is insufficient to deal with. And this brings a whole new dimension. And with respect to climate change, I, I very much hope that it is possible to engage with, uh, with China. And the Biden administration gives us hope that, uh, that this will be an area which is more cooperative than adversarial. But we obviously need to bear in mind that there will be adversarial aspects to the rise of China. Uh, the nature of the um, non-democratic uh, regime, I think, has found already an interesting um, suggestion in the incoming Biden administration, the idea of a forum of democracies. This kind of uh, issue, I think, we need to be able to, to tackle with. As ministers of uh, defense, though, it seems to me that the nature of the relationship with China is uh, only partially related to our responsibilities. We have to be able to face those responsibilities, for example, standing with allies with respect to um, uh, dimensions of the South China Sea or others. But uh, this, is, this is something that goes well beyond our uh, defense uh, realm. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Minister. I hope that um, in Romania, um, security situation is uh, stable and that Minister uh, will, will return to us in a, in a minute. So uh, maybe uh, let me proceed with the questions uh, from young transatlantic leaders before, uh, before Minister of Romania will, will uh, get back to us. And uh, so we can hear the questions uh, from the, the next generations. Uh, um, so. Let me invite you to listen to questions from young, uh, young leaders. Uh, one is from, uh, from Georgia and another from Ukraine. Hello, my name is Nina Kutetvashvili. I'm from Georgia. And currently I'm participating in the program of Academy of Young Diplomacy. Here's my question. Uh, it is a quite well-known tendency that uh, energy-rich authoritarian regimes use their energy exports as a foreign policy tools. So how effective do you think the Russian energy coercion has been in achieving Kremlin strategic aims? And also what needs to be done to prevent authoritarian regimes for, uh, from employing such strategies? Thank you. Hello, my name is Vladislav Zinichenko. I am from Ukraine. I am a participant of the Academy of Young Diplomats. My question is, how do you assess Europe's readiness to the latest escalation between Azerbaijan and Armenia. Thank you. 
Well, as you see, the questions are not easy. So the first one is about energy coercion of Russia, and the second, uh, how we should respond to the conflict uh, between Azerbaijan and Armenia. Of course, the status of the conflict is uh, is evolving each day, as we uh, as we see. So right now we have a, we have a truce, but uh, but uh, we know that situation is quite uh, quite complicated over there. So. Uh, who would like to start first? You don't have to respond to both questions. You can choose when the the the, mm, the privilege of the first. Who would like to start? Yuri, back to you. But we don't hear you. I've, oh, now. Now it's better. Now it's now it's good. Uh, uh, very quickly on 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 both issues. Obviously, there is no doubt that uh, Russia uses uh, energy as one of the tools of uh, putting pressure on, uh, on other countries. Uh, I think uh, often they have overplayed their hand, and uh, especially in relations to European Union. European Union has done major efforts in diversifying its uh, uh, energy consumption. Uh, and I think it is also very positive that the issue of Nord Stream 2 has been put uh, to the table because from the Estonian point of view, it is a purely political uh, project uh, and its main reason is to circumvent uh, Ukraine. Uh, so I, I think these are serious issues which, which should be discussed. Now, when it comes to the Azeri uh, Armenian conflict, then, of course, we are all happy that the violence has stopped uh, and uh, the civilian population is uh, no more uh, in danger. On the other hand, the, the, uh, the peace agreement and, and the process, I think, has put uh, Russia to a very complicated position. I mean, there are analysts who believe that Russia somehow kind of achieved more power and prestige by, by conducting this, uh, uh, this mediation, I'm, 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 I'm doubtful. I, I think, uh, especially with the Armenia, uh, the, the, the Russia, Russia is getting a lot of criticism uh, from, uh, from the Armenian side, uh, clearly a strong ally traditionally of Russia. But this is a long story, so I won't go of course. Details. Thank you. Thank you very much. Since we, we have back with us uh, Nikola Chuka, uh, and I, I think that for a second we had uh, your Deputy Minister of Defense as well with us, so um, I'm sorry I didn't uh, introduce her. But, uh, Minister, um, uh, if I could uh, repeat uh, to you the question of our Georgian, uh, Georgian uh, young transatlantic leader that was uh, concerned about. Uh, the role that uh, that uh, that uh, Russia is uh, um, how Russia is using energy as a, as a weapon, and uh, do you think it's a it's a it's a threat uh, for uh, for countries that authoritarian regimes are uh, employing uh, energy as a, as a weapon? Is it a concern uh, to you also in uh, in uh, in Romania? Uh, good afternoon. First of all, let me um, salute my very good friends, uh, Joao and Yuri, and uh, to uh, um, express my gratitude for being invited to take part in this very prestigious panel. Second, um, um, I think you notice how uh, easy we solve the problem of uh, gender balance. How easy we, <laughs> we, we, uh, we share responsibilities in between men and women uh, within our Ministry of Defense. So uh, I think uh, when you ask about energy, um, you have in mind that the energy is it's an instrument of power or it's, at least it's part of an instrument of power. So uh, based on that, I think uh, 
energy is a complementary tool which can be used in uh, uh, in your uh, um, activities, your um, approach to defeat someone, or in your approach to uh, achieve your own goals. So, looking to uh, what's happening uh, uh, right now, we can we can see the energy corridors playing a very relevant role in uh, what means the uh, um, all, all, all the efforts done to ensure uh, all the European countries with the required amount of gas, power, whatever, everything which is related to, to energy. And uh, also, um, how easy by taking decision, you can avoid some of the countries which are really uh, in uh, 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 facing the lack of, of these uh, uh, energetic resources, or uh, in other way, to bypass some of the countries which are really uh, looking to be part of the um, energy corridors. So yes, energy is part of the instruments of power. They can be used. And uh, by leveraging the, the pipes of energy, you can also threat someone taking into account that we also have some examples in our history. And Minister, since I have you um, um, on, on there, if I could ask you one more question, um, and it's more about uh, military acquisition. Um, I would like to ask you a question uh, from uh, Piotr Grogowski, who is uh, representing a Konsberg company. And he is asking, uh, uh, what is the Romanian perspective on acquisition of the military equipment from uh, the United States and the presence of US troops in Romania? Uh, could you share your uh, perspective on, on, on the subject? So acquisition of equipment, military equipment from US and presence of US troops in uh, Romania. So, um, first of all, um, let's, let's, uh, let me share with you that uh, we, have, uh, we have decided to um, um, be a very uh, reliable ally uh, and uh, to uh, accomplish the requirement of burden, sh burden sharing. So since that has been decided at uh, NATO political uh, leadership level, Romania have started since 2017 to ensure 2% from our GDP for defense. Based on that, we are having a very clear um, uh, line horizon for planning our uh, um, acquisition program, which are, uh, of course, uh, looking at the end to raise the um, uh, readiness uh, of our armed forces and also to create those capabilities which give us that. Uh, military relevance um, in order to, um, at the national level, to integrate all the other instruments of power and to raise the uh, level of national resilience and within the alliance to be that pillar which you can rely on, you may rely on when it comes about the security in, in, the, in the Black Sea region. So based on that, we, were, we have decided at the Ministry of Defense uh, uh, leadership level and also at our National Security Council, um, what are the capabilities we are really, uh, which are really relevant for us. And we have decided to buy, um, uh, to start buying the uh, air defense capability 
and, and uh, also the um, long distance um, uh, precise strike capabilities. So in other words, we have decided to buy a Patriot and a HIMARS system. So those are the, the capabilities who have been um, um, uh, um, Thank you. Thank you, Minister. I think it's very, uh, from actually it's quite precise answer. And uh, I apologize. I didn't promise I will be asking uh, easy questions. And since our uh, viewers are asking and asking, uh, asking us to forward uh, the questions. Um, another question, um, if I may ask uh, uh, our, uh, our guest from, uh, from, from Portugal. Um, what can and should NATO allies do to moderate and restrain Turkey. It's not easy, I know. No, <laughs> thank you very much for asking me that question. <laughs> um, well, uh, look, in the first place, uh, Turkey is an ally. <clears throat> Turkey is an ally of ours and it's an important ally. We've been uh, through many, many different times in, uh, in NATO with different allies. And uh, I think that we have to have some historical distance and not, uh, and not be uh, imagined that this precise moment is one that we're going to be living through uh, for forever. So at the moment, this is, we, have, um, we, shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't downplay the nature of the difficulties that we have at the moment. And there's one uh, aspect in which I have to say that uh, it is important that uh, Turkey should, um, should, 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 should understand in order for us to create a, a good basis for the rapprochement that we all, that we all need, which is that uh, Turkey specific issues should not keep everything else hostage in, uh, in NATO. And I, I believe that our um, friends in Romania and in, in Estonia and all the Baltic countries understand very well uh, the point that I'm making in this respect. We have to cordon off the issues where we have differences of opinion and work on those. We have uh, in the Eastern Mediterranean, uh, I think it's very important that NATO Secretary General remains fully engaged in uh, mediating and creating bridges between um, between Greece and, and Turkey in particular. I think that uh, the incoming Biden administration will also have to be very, very quickly engaged uh, with uh, Turkey because the United States has such a significant leadership role uh, in NATO. So the uh, basic point that I'm making is we need Turkey. Turkey needs us. We need to be able to find solutions. We shouldn't uh, over should neither understate the nature of the problems and we also should not imagine that this is condemning us to in NATO to a life without Turkey because I don't believe that's going to be the case. But we have a lot of efforts that we need to be putting into it and we need to, of course, to have the re reciprocal effort from, uh, uh, from, from our friends in Ankara. Thank you, Minister. Uh, my next question is to uh, Minister Yuri Luik uh, and it's about Belarus. Um, the, the, the last president of, uh, of, uh, of Belarus, uh, Mr. Lukashenko, is accusing uh, it, its neighbors, uh, Belarusian neighbors, for uh, um, running a coup against his uh, leadership. Uh, what would you say to President Lukashenko? Uh, if you would have this opportunity um, responding to those accusations. Well, it, it's of course a, a ridiculous accusation. And uh, it is obvious that uh, the victory of the uh, Belarusian Democratic Forces, forces uh, should be recognized by Lukashenko. I mean, that's the nature of democracy. People vote and the result is uh, recognized. And what the European Union is doing is really highlighting uh, the fact that uh, the elections, democratic elections, uh, have not been realized in the change of government in Belarusia. Uh, I think uh, 
sometimes people tell us, uh, you know, EU is just talking and talking. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's very important. When I think back to our own battles to get freedom from the Soviet Union, then the fact that the Western countries talked about our fight, recognized our aspirations, and saw them as legitimate, and the Soviet uh, moves as illegitimate, uh, was an enormous help to us, was an enormous help to our people. And I think that is what, uh, uh, what we can do. And of course, also, the European Union has uh, put forward uh, sanctions. Again, one of the tools at our, uh, at our disposal, which again shows uh, that uh, uh, Lukashenko has really cheated its own people out of their democratic choice, and this will not pass. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, another question I ha we have from Alexandra Suprun, and it's a question to Minister uh, Gravinia. In Eastern and another, nor uh, Northern part of Europe, we are very concerned about Russia. However, in South of Europe, this threat may not be so topical. Could you elaborate on how Portugal views Russia? Well, Russia is not on our borders. Uh, so, of course, the feeling of uh, threat to our national borders is not there as it is in, uh, in other countries. And as I said, uh, the two countries that I have visited since COVID have been Estonia and, and Romania. Um, we, we have, uh, we, as allies, we believe that it is our duty to be present uh, side by side with uh, all of our other allies. And this means uh, being in the Baltic countries and we have air policing missions, we have uh, Marines in, in, in Lithuania every year. So, and we have in Romania, we are increasing in 2021, our presence also there with tailored forward presence. So uh, we, we feel fully committed to the challenges that are on the immediate borders of, uh, of countries that, that, that are next to Russia, but we see NATO as a whole and they are, a NATO, they are NATO borders and we uh, believe that as allies, we have to treat them as uh, our own borders. So full solidarity. Uh, threats are coming from Russia, they are also coming from other parts, and this is the, the 360 degree uh, concept that, that we've all been working on, and, and uh, I see uh, countries that border on Russia, Estonia is a, a good example, also deeply committed, for example, in, in Africa, in the Sahel, and in, in other kinds of uh, missions, because of uh, this uh, notion that, that the security that we seek to promote in the European continent is, uh, is indivisible from security from in a wider uh, region. And so we, we all owe this to, to each other. So I, I hope that uh, Alexander, uh, who's asking the question, uh, can be completely uh, confident in the notion that Portugal takes its responsibilities as an ally very, very seriously, even though we are as far from Russia as, as you can get in the European continent. As a, as a think tanker, I, I couldn't resist to, to ask you a typical question that we have during the, the um, panel discussions. Uh, since we are coming to the, to the conclusions and uh, we have uh, six minutes uh, left, uh, I would like to ask you uh, for up to one minute uh, conclusion, but if you could focus on one or two things that we forgot to mention in reference to the European architecture security, what we should keep in mind and what we didn't touch today's discussion. So uh, maybe, maybe Yuri or, uh, or uh, Nicolau. Oh, we have to turn on the mic. Sorry. Uh, I think uh, what, what we didn't touch is uh, are the uh, security implication of COVID, although you discuss it, of course, elsewhere. But I, but I think we have to be very clear in looking how we are prepared for future epidemiological crises. 
uh, and what new structures inside European Union should we create to be ready? Because there will be an ob- other epidemiological crisis and we should look at it very carefully. For instance, uh, uh, one of the challenges, surprisingly, is the selling of live animals, the trade in live animals, which has paradoxically become a major security issue because that is really one of the sources of epidemiological crisis. So, so the security obviously is not only military and we all know it very well. Thanks. Thank you. I think it's very, very appealing to all of our um, countries and we all are concerned about pandemia these days. It's very, very important, I believe. So, um, Nicola Chuka, Minister, what, 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 what is your opinion? What we forget to mention in today's uh, discussion and what, what, what is affecting our security? Um, we are having a very uh, short time to cover all the security issues. So, um, as Yuri and uh, Joao have mentioned, and of course, all the questions. Who, uh, which were addressed or showing that uh, uh, security is a uh, concern of not only for think tankers or uh, 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 security responsibles, uh, former uh, uh, responsibles from, from uh, um, uh, all the points of view, but uh, it's, uh, that, that means uh, that uh, we should uh, learn from uh, this year of uh, uh, trying to find all the, the solutions to cope with, uh, with all the conventional and unconventional security challenges and threats uh, uh, inside a very difficult situation. This pandemic was really surprising all of us. And uh, we should uh, take into consideration that in the beginning, uh, each country tried to solve by itself the problem, but then uh, uh, step by step, we realized that we cannot do it by ourselves and we need to, to, uh, to cooperate and to, to share uh, with uh, all the other uh, aligned European countries uh, how we can leverage all those instruments to solve this, this issue and also we are very much, we are continuing to focus on all the other security uh, uh, threats. So I think uh, what we have to keep in mind is that what we learned this year, we should consider to be um, a little bit m- more complex and to expect in the future to to see uh, more, more. We should more use simply security. this experience. Uh, thank you, Minister. I, and uh, use this experience. Yes, I fully you. agree with you. And uh, a brief answer from our Portuguese friend. Well, thank you. I, I just um, I can build on uh, what uh, Yuri and uh, Nikolai have said by saying that um, one aspect that we should be focusing on now, and we have the good fortune in Portugal of being in the presidency of the European Union in the next semester, is EU-NATO cooperation. Because the kind of non-conventional uh, threats that uh, that are uh, potential uh, risks for us that we have become very aware of with the pandemic are serious threats to our security, but they're not the kind of threats that NATO has all of the instruments to deal with. Uh, the European Union, of course, with its enormous range of, of tools and instruments that penetrate deep into our societies, is actually uh, very well uh, positioned to partner with NATO on uh, non-conventional threats, hybrid uh, threats, cyber issues. And I think that this is an area which is very promising for us to work on in terms of EU-NATO cooperation. Thank you very much. Uh, I promised you to present uh, results of the opinion poll uh, with the question, is American presence in Europe a condition for European security? So let me present you the answers. So the answer 70% is yes. So I will leave, uh, leave, I will leave you with these uh, results uh, for uh, later conversations. But it looks that uh, that we rely quite heavily on our American friends. Um,
since we have still 10 seconds, let me just uh, uh, thank you very much for your time and for your uh, thoughts and sharing with uh, all uh, European and transatlantic uh, community. But uh, one more thing. Uh, I hope that we'll be able to see each other in presence in Warsaw in June 2021 during the Warsaw Security Forum that we hopefully will do in a post-pandemia world. So uh, please keep uh, fingers crossed that uh, we'll have uh, a bit more air to breathe when the next time we'll see each other. So thank you very much once again for your time and have a great afternoon here and in the uh, US. Have a great morning. Thank you very much.